What I love is how similar these lava flows look like the ones on Hawaii. Yes. On the different islands, you know, you can see that similarity and composition and flow. And, um, you know, if you go to any of the islands, you'll see this, this type of topography. Of course, covered with vegetation. So the erosional like processes in the ocean are mostly water currents. Oh. You guys are really close to the waypoint here. Still have lots of time. We still have some folks coming in and uh, out for dinner time. I always think this time is funny because like it's just a mashup of all the watches and I never get to sit on here with some of you. Yeah, it's always funny that during dinner time there's always a weird group of people in the room. And that just makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass it off to Derek. All right, bye. Thank you. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Sebastian, how many samples did we end up taking today? How many have we dive? taken? Or just in general on this dive? On this dive. Um, let me see here. I remember the rock that we took earlier on our dive with the like little individual coral polyps we were interested in. We are at 11. Yeah, Taylor's watched to quite a bit of rocks. Rocks? Oh. Yeah. So we are due for another rock soon at Warp Point 8, I believe. Not a lot of bio, though. It's just the uh, sea pen that was collected um, earlier in the dive, and then the red polyp rock that we collected. Mm -hmm. What do we have for dinner tonight? <laughs> it's nice, it's good. It's a good spread. Good spread? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for our viewers that have not heard before, for all of our meals, we have this like amazing just buffet, just so many choices of different kind of food options at each meal. So many choices. Mm -hmm. I rarely even pick a third of them. <laughs>
So for those of you joining us at this dinner hour, aloha ahi ahi, good evening. We are coming live to you from Papa Hanau Mokuakea Marine National Monument, the largest marine protected area in the United States. Larger than all the national parks um, throughout the country. So a really incredible, um, diverse, and sacred place to Kanaka O'ivi, or the native people of Hawaii. Glad you folks can join us. Mm -hmm. yes, I think we'll just go slow and just kind of go a lot back and forth, scoping around. Hannah's missing out on some cool rock formations. We could try to kind of circumnavigate this before going up to the top because there's nowhere else to go after that. This reminds me of an area on the North Shore where there's a hiking trail that goes up. But it's kind of dangerous because there's a lot of rock fall that happens here. And people have actually had like boulders fall on them because wow. the salt is so brittle. Well, that's pretty remarkable. If only we had a geologist. I know. Where's she at? be cool if in uh, addition to the scaling lasers we could you know project a hologram of like a person or a banana Bridge nav. Could we please do a ship move fifteen meters at bearing three one five? Thank you. Obviously, we were looking up all the Chana Cops pictures. Did you guys see any on your watch? Uh, not today. Uh, okay. No, actually, like, this morning we saw one. You did? Okay. But yeah. it was not a Chana Cops. It was in the same family. Oh, okay. Chanaks. 
Yeah, we, we actually saw three of them. It was crazy. That's good. But I don't think, I don't remember seeing any on previous dives, no. but I might have forgotten. No, we didn't see on the other seamounts as well. Yeah. It was just on this one. Well, we this, saw one, one. this one's a deeper seamount. Yeah. Like, we're at our highest, and it's only going to be like 1,500 meters. Yeah. Almost at waypoint eight. So we, <coughs> we have a, an hour more of bottom time. Yep. So we could either try to like circle around this last feet pinnacle top, or yeah. we could just go right up to it and then like, kind of head north. Uh, can you zoom out on the screen? So, so obviously it's downhill a bit, but yeah. it's, it's uh, not super tight. I think um, if we kind of move like to the right and just kind of lateral around the edge of the rise, I think that might be a good use of time. Oh, look at those red ones. That's nice. Yeah, so those are, uh, so we have some metallogorgias. Uh, I think there's a small iridogorgia in the corner, and these would be in the family Coralidae, probably Paragorgias. All right, that's cool. Uh, difficult to ID unless we're zooming in on them, but yeah, definitely in the family Coralidae. Yeah. Paragorgia. Let's play Spets. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Just filling in for a minute for Tori while she eats dinner. This is Daniel Kinzer, SCF. Aloha. Hey, Daniel. It's great to be here with you all. We were having a discussion or earlier about the, the term Gorgia. Because oh. there's so many of the different corals, yeah. like Metallogorgia and Paragorgia. Aridogorgia. So we were trying to look at what that root word was. Yeah. What so we, we kind of looked in the Latin, but then we thought, oh, maybe it's Greek. Yeah. And so uh, Sebastian looked it up. And what were some of the definitions? The Greek, it was very different than the um, Latin. Huh. I think it has got real, uh, something to do with uh, gorgon and the protein, one of the protein components that's found in the octocorals. I think it's, it probably came for, from that. But I can look up the etymology for all of these. Yeah, we, we tried that. It wasn't clear like if it was Latin or Greek or... There are a couple of yeah, different options. Like Whirlpool was one of them, and then there was, um, what was the other one that he was talking about? Fierce. That's not helpful. One of the words no, was I think it's from Gargolin. That's like a kind of protein that's found specifically in the skeletal material uh, of the octocorals. That would make sense, but, but it's the not word as interesting. Question <laughs> it's, not, yeah, it's not that flamboyant. Yeah, we looked that up too and didn't really see any. The root word question still remains because yeah. uh, even that out. protein would be yeah. derived Named out of after some something. Latin that's true, Greek, yeah. That's true, yeah. Latin or Greek original name. So, super interesting. These namings. I like when the Hawaiian kids name stuff. That's a big that's mouth true. eel. Yep, that's right. <laughs> it is. You're right. It looks. Everyone can remember that. With the polyps closed, it's very difficult. And previously, we were. Uh, Looking at uh, beautiful Metallogorgia with uh, Ophiocris Oedipus uh, Ophiroid in it. Do oh. the Paragorgias and the Ophiroid do they do they sort of pair for yeah, life? Yeah, the Metallogorgia and the Ophiroids, oh. yes. So the one species of Metallogorgia, the Metallogorgia melanotrichus, oh, it would be lovely. Can we zoom in on these yellow uh, fans? Please? These guys? Yes. Thank yeah, you. that's why they're called pear agorgia. <laughs> no, that's metallogorgia. They're not with the paragorgias. <laughs> Ow. Uh, so, on. yeah, the melanotrichus and these uh, ophiroids are always associated together. This is like the it's most, the most uh, Dense. concentration yeah. we've seen the entire dive. Is that, yeah. that noritogorgia over there? No. Or? No, that's a bathypath. He's the more uh, the orange one in the center, yeah. and these are again coralids. Oh no, I see it. It's not spiraling. It's just uh, probably you know. paragorgias with a bunch of squat lobsters. You're gonna get a kick out of this. Um, Hannah told us uh, that her sister thought gorgia was a uh, like a. Sh we uh, heard that I was in the lounge. Yeah. Yeah. A short version oh. of gorgeous. Oh my <laughs> so almost gorgeous, but not enough. It's so funny. It's so good. I mean, and a lot of times, you know, it, you know, the scientific names are not commonly 
you know, used no, in, in, yeah. in talk. I mean, we, we know corals, we know brain coral, we know fire coral, and that's, pr you know, pretty much about it. Um, so, yeah, this Maybe sort of stuff is... Maybe tilt up to the one furthest away. Okay, this is interesting. Yeah, I think that's so. Do we have anybody on the chat? Okay. Science this chat? This looks like... Can and be a Paragorgia or a Paramarciad. And then the foreground one. And in the front we have some hydro... Hydrozoans, yes, we have some hydrozoans overgrowing the stalks. That's in the front. Right. But the more yellow at the back, that's what I'm trying to ID. That's a good zoom, thank you. Should Come on out. Uh, eDNA sample here? Yeah, that would be good actually. Yeah, that would be great. This is the highest density of mm -hmm. corals, and then there's also we a black coral. Yeah. Some metallogorgia were nearby. So. Ship, oh, push. Is, ship is stopped. Water sample? Mm -hmm. so we're, time. We're going to do a water sample? Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So Niskin's five and six have already been fired. So you can go for um, four, three, two, or one, whichever you, you decide. And just to explain a little bit about eDNA, um, this allows us to get a snapshot of like what organisms may live here without having to take tissues from them specifically. But because you know they're spawning in these areas and maybe some um, tissue shedding, and uh, we can kind of get a capture of what species are here with the eDNA samples. Yeah, it's a really um, it's a really clever Thank idea. You. Like it's a uh, Anything we can do that's non-invasive is great, and you know we do that in archaeology too. Any sort of remote sensing or you know ground penetrating uh, radar or sense, you know sensing like that that can give us information before we excavate to help us excavate as little as possible is uh, always appreciated because then we you know we can learn more from less. Uh, and I you know eDNA is a, a similar way. Like once we have a database of all of this genetic information, it'll make. Um, you know, identifying communities that much easier and, and less harmful to those communities. Yeah, exactly. And as we're in a sacred waters here, um, the least invasive is uh, I is think possible four. Is Stand by. Oh, yeah. Uh, Niskin four. Four, I. Niskin triggered. And that is sample number awesome. 079. Oh, and I guess um, maybe I should mention how Niskins work. We just we just keep we keep keep saying Niskins all the time. So uh, for viewers who are tuning in and, and, and don't know, the Niskin bottles have a, a top and a bottom that are opened with a spring. And so when we uh, put Hercules in the water, uh, all of them are open, and um, water can flow through them up and down vertically um you know as the as the vehicle moves around and so when we say we trigger one or we fire one we the rov pulls a a tab that r releases the spring in the top and bottom close so we get a, a capsule basically of the water from whatever depth or area that we're working in and then when we bring it back to the surface we have that water uh captured but if, it, if we don't trigger them then it just flushes through and you know drains out as it, as it would if it's if it's open so it helps it's a very easy way uh to to, to sample the bottom water um with really just just a quick motion of the of the mechanical arm quick and easy i'm wondering if this is kind of the top of this Jelly. There you go. Disappearing That's jelly. Good. Yeah, really. Jake's gonna hunt it down. Did you have it around your arm the whole time you had dinner? Oh, how'd that get there? Oh. <laughs> okay.
I was uh, filling Upajna in on um, on what your sister said about the gorgeous, and she said we heard that in the lounge, <laughs> which is hilarious. I love that. So, watch the. Do you want to go to the right or the left? Does it matter? Yeah, let's go to the right. Um, consistent with how I do shipwrecks, for some reason going counterclockwise just <laughs> works. It's also how I dive the caverns and the springs. I always go counterclockwise. I don't know why. I tried going the other way because they're like, oh, if you if you go in two directions, then it feels like a totally different dive. I'm like, dive. I'm like, this just feels wrong. Going to work with the current coming from the east. Oh yeah, if, if the current is an issue, go the other way. <laughs> you don't have any issues like holding. All good, no problem with the current. Bridge nav. Can we do 10 meters at bearing 020? Hannah, since we got um, pretty much two waypoint eight, we're going to kind of like circumnavigate the the, 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 pin, the pinnacle here, yeah. Fun. Daniel's really hard at work figuring out this uh, Gorgia meaning. <laughs> Fascinating, yeah. <laughs> you know, potentially, um, Gorgos, this root word in, in Latin and Greek, uh, might actually be tied all the way back to a Sanskrit word. Oh, wow. Um, that, that meant to make this guttural sound, this growl. Uh, huh. But uh, generally considered to mean kind of a dreadful character or beast in uh, Greek mythology. and. And uh, so I wonder how these beautiful things yeah. and, and these incredible, maybe these proteins are really ugly if you zoom in close enough. Uh, maybe the, the Gorgonan protein looks like a yeah. Greek monster. Yeah, I think Sebastian said that there was another meaning that meant like, uh, like it, it's bendable or like flexible. Because they're, they're not stony corals, right? Yes. Yeah, so they're not that would stony make sense. corals. Yeah, that would kind of line up because um, we've been seeing hemicralliums and then also paragorgia which would look which look very similar yeah but the way you can tell them apart is if um, like you touch it a hemicralium would would be more brittle whereas the paragorgids are more flexible, flexible. yeah mm -hmm. so, interesting i wonder yeah where the yeah. roots of these names come from especially for a protein like how would you get yeah. a protein right interesting. etymology right this uh where the study of of where our knowledge and specifically words yeah. describing that knowledge comes from really fascinating it is very fascinating a lot of stories thanks for trying to trace that back yeah just fun just fun i love it because in the sanskrit language this is of course the ancient ancient language coming out of uh, what's what's now you know large parts of southern asia mostly india um that word in particular uh, ga something like garg, but would have been uh, potentially like onomatopoeia, would have actually been the sound. The sound it made, yeah. Made when you have that low rumbling kind of uh, growl. Yeah. Or Gorg. guttural, guttural sound. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, evolution of language. Well, it might be where the word like gorge, like the canyon gorge mm -hmm. comes from. Oh, yeah, could be. It would make sense. And, and Gorg gorge because it's this noise your stomach makes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was one of the things we were talking about languages on watch yesterday, and I only ever took Latin in high school and college. And uh, so this is a metallogorgia. Oh, there it is. Yes. Yep. Coming off screen. Good, good spot. Also a same root. That's right. There's a large family of uh, maybe it's it might not be a family, it might be a genus. I'm not sure, but. Um, the Gordian. Sorry, Mike, I didn't no, mean to fine. interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, you said you were taking Latin. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's really useful for, you know, understanding how 
um, presume both here. English and scientific languages are put together and th this sort of thing uh, the roots and and where you know some of it was some of it was Latin words some of it was Latin words that came from Greek or as you said Sanskrit or you know other older uh, mm -hmm. languages yeah. um, then there's a oh, whole bunch right. of biology terms that are just completely Coming made out. up Latin words <laughs> you know they'll name it after someone's last name like Smithicus or something after someone who founded it. That's her. right. Smithicus. And it's like, well, that's not Latin. Nope. Forgot to write back out. But it sounds smarter. It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple of species that were that are were discovered in Palau, and they named them after our presidents, but they tacked on the like a, or, uh, so yeah, yeah. to make it sound Come on. Uh, yeah. Latin. <laughs> Come on, humans. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> well, like the, um, the, the, the one of the bacteria that... Um, Forms of rusticles was named Titanic, Rusticus Titanicus, um, <laughs> after Titanic, um, which I think is funny. Easy to remember. Yeah, it's easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, probably the only species name geology I know. Looks like a big backbone. Actually, I know some shark species. What? The geology looks like a big backbone line. Uh, yeah, isn't yeah, it, it looks cool? like a dike. Or at least to me, it looks like a dike. That's an intrusion event. That's like uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the words. Oh, I don't really know what they one. mean. There's but two of them. Yeah. Oh, hey. They almost look like falling over dominoes. This, They're so perfectly be. square. Yeah. The like the sharp oh, angle. Yeah, it's so yeah. cool. Yeah, look at that. Oh, this could be a lost city. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> we had a yellow brick road a couple years ago. <laughs> I love I love throwing the internet a bone. You guys go crazy, all right? Search it up. Tell us, tell us all the things. All the <laughs> we have a sunken, we have an ancient sunken, well, rumored, mythical sunken village in Palau too on oh, the really? east side. Yeah, I think a lot of cultures might have that. What um, what depth is that at? Oh, um, like is I it? I don't think it's. Re I don't know if it's real. Um, no, I'm just curious. Like, is it is it a dive site or is it like deep? Like I think it's deep. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a part of a legend where um, in this village called Niwal, uh, this older woman was kind of cast out. So she prayed to have sustenance, so a, a breadfruit. Uh, she was able to cut off the branches and then uh, see water and like animals float out so she could eat seafood. Mm. And then the people of the village found out and they were jealous of her, so they cut it down and then it flooded the entire village. Oh, that's wow. it. Yeah. Interesting s story. It's funny the number of times in history that breadfruit pops up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just a little bit of a little bit of interesting uh, insight and context in the in the Gorgonin protein and, and Gorgian uh, naming is that um, we called it uh, we called these the Gorgians well before we had the tools and technology to identify the protein. So uh, we oh, saw yeah. the whole huh. organism. So, so it couldn't a, be that then. So it wasn't named. Maybe the protein uh, was named for that. Perhaps. Uh, might have been associated, might have been uh, first isolated yeah. from sam biological tissue um, of these soft corals and then given a name. So that, you know, continues to, li I like this flexibility kind of idea, this characteristic. Yeah. Uh, just interesting. It makes sense for it. Because that is one of its identifying features. Yeah. What? So we got about uh, 40 minutes of Yeah, language is so interesting because it has so much of like culture and history attached to it that we can um, yeah. suss out. All of our mistakes embedded, <laughs> and uh, absolutely. Got to be careful with the words we use. And trying to know where they come from is a good start. Yeah, I think it's really cool that the Hawaiian language, uh, or uh, sorry, that Hawaiian uses a shorter alphabet. Yeah. Um, which means that the words are going to be longer, which yeah. I think is cool. I mean, like does, yeah. Papa Hanamakuakea is a. Well, it's actually it's actually kind of a, a sentence so in English. Very you know? complex. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very a very complex yeah, word. Yeah, oh, but they, they it's kind of like German how it it strings together. Mm -hmm. uh, phrases or syllables rather than making a new word, which yeah. I think is, is uh, interesting because you can break it apart easier. I think the reality, it. absolutely. The reality is too is that, you know, Hawaiian wasn't written down for thousands of years oh, like yeah, many yeah, other yeah. languages and, and really 
trying to understand it from an English perspective is, uh, you know, gets in the way of understanding the language. That as, makes sense. As we know, across many languages, there's often not yeah. a direct translation unless they have the same root system. Yeah, like Malia would say, like, you know, but it's it's not the ocean. It's like the deep, dark yeah. part of the ocean. So, you know, th yeah. so those words have more than just that simple translation. That's right. And uh, like a lot like that Sanskrit, you know, uh, term for this guttural sound, a lot of uh, indigenous languages would incorporate sounds from nature, concepts from oh, yeah. nature into their language and to describe what's going on. I had the pleasure and privilege of spending a few days with the Hadza people, Hadzabe tribe and northern Tanzania, one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer communities oh, wow. on the planet, and they speak in uh, incredible clicks and uh, and various kinds of guttural sounds. And, and when they tell you a story of a hunt, they sort of bring all of the creatures that they were hunting to life because they, to tell you that they're hunting something, they'll just make the sound of that animal. Oh. Oh. Is that like a conglomerate? Oh. Mm, no, I don't think so. I think. I would probably lean more towards botryoidal, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Huh. Weird. Botryoidal manganese. Botryoidal. Botryoidal. Or lost Great word. Which one? Oh, a jelly. Or is that a jelly or a tina, tina four? Oh, that's a jelly. That's a jelly, yeah. Oh, oh wait. Jelly I have thing. the, I have the whole have the Hawaiian word for that. Yeah, I think it's Puilala. Get it. Puilala. Hui, hui lava? Oh, puilala. Hold up. Sorry, help I us, Danielle. We're just probably. <laughs> I actually, to be honest, have no idea. Oh, Holo, Hololia? Hololia? Hololia. 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 That's what I wrote down. Hololia. <laughs> Hololia. Thank you, Hannah. Well done. Oh, look at it go. It's dancing. That's, <laughs> that's getting spun around by our thrusters. No, no, it's dancing. <laughs> it's dancing. Come it's, on, Jake. It's come on. choosing to do mm. that. <laughs> Jake was just helping it do a little, little show. Yeah. <laughs> little guy. It's having a good time. <laughs> Now, G being a pain. Nothing new. The jellies look like so much more fun here than <laughs> in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> look like they're gonna—they're down they're for a good time. They're much happier here. Yes. They have uh, <laughs> those uh, non-stinging jellies in uh, Palau, in right? Palau, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, they do. <gasps> yeah. Non-sting. In a lake. <laughs> Yeah, you get to swim among them. It's actually, I mean, the first time that I swam, like, among them, I was like, this is a little, like, I was a little grossed out. But Because <laughs> <laughs> there's, like, so many squishy things. Because you're covered in yeah. jelly. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but, um, so basically they're in a marine lake, which huh. is enclosed, but it does have, like, little vents that goes out to the ocean. So it has... Um, ocean water and because they are in the lake and they have no predators they evolved to not need the stinging mechanism oh. yeah oh i would love to go do, I feel do like they like being like do they like people swimming with them well they didn't they know don't really they, have they didn't know <laughs> people were going to start coming in or they would have kept their stinging uh, that's what i was thinking i, was I mean like, yeah, they yeah. don't display any sort of like, they don't seem to notice that you're there, like when you're among them. And their abundance actually um, is being studied a lot. Um, and it has, sometimes there's a lot and sometimes there's very little. And it's huh. believed that it has to do more with um, like sunlight and uh, the acidity of the ocean water what, rather than human impacts, which was it was believed it sort of impacts it but now hmm. more studies see it's more of like a natural cycle that happens so yeah fascinating our planet one of the cool things okay yeah let's go to palau yeah everyone and we is are. welcome yeah. and we are you guys can stay at my house the internet is cheering. Tori is back. Not yeah. the internet. You guys can stay the at my house. The internet can stay at your house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll yeah. That. Didn't mean to invite the internet over to your house. <laughs> All right. Aloha, everyone. Ahui ho. Aloha. No. 
I've uh, never been to Palau, but that might change in a year. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed. I also really enjoy uh, Samoa and independent Samoa. Yeah, so have you been to both Samoas? Yeah. Nice. I've only been to Samoa and not had right. a chance to for American Samoa. Is it pretty similar, like lifestyle-wise? No, there. It's it's the islands are like uh, I don't know. They just felt created different. Uh, Apia is a much busier kind of city than okay. like Pongo Pongo is. Okay. A little smaller feel, yeah, I, but yeah, a lot of people who work on Pongo Pongo come from Apia, like oh, each day. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I know American Samoa is a lot smaller in comparison. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because um, American Samoa obviously is an American aligned with the United States. And then uh, Samoa, I think one of their biggest influences was like, the British and the Germans. So they also have different accents mm -hmm. uh, from what I've heard. So pretty cool. We'll be up for watch this tomorrow morning. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking up because I realized I had no idea what Palau was. I was like, I have no idea. So oh, yeah. I've just been looking up where it is and I'm like, wait, this is so cool. I'm pretty sure there's only like one place in Palau that handles a vessel of this size, but might be more. You mean where uh, it could dock? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there on the far right. Yeah, so um, we do have a lot of shallow water reefs surrounding our main island. So there are two main channels where um, we receive like large cargo ships. There's And they're both on the west side. So there's one mm -hmm. a little farther north and then there's one right next to the main um, island, uh, the main center of commerce, Karor, and that's where a lot of um, ships are get, get received because there's the channel is deep enough. And where do a lot of your goods come in from? Um, so as far as I'm aware, we, re we receive shipping from all over the world, but um, mainly I think our like fresh produce and a lot of what we, like foods we import are from Asia. So like mm -hmm. um, Taiwan, Philippines, Japan. Yeah, and then we do get some some cargo from the United States. We do have um, Amazon <laughs> over there yeah. too, online shopping. Um, but a lot of those come in by airplane, not by ship. Right. I'm still looking and I see there's something called the Milky Way. Yeah, so that's another tourist, I mean, sorry, not a tourist. I mean, a lot of tourists like to go there, but locals enjoy it as well. It's basically like an enclosed part of the limestone islands that has gathered like, um, it's like a limestone mud. I see, I see photos of like people covered in it. Yeah, so they believe that it give, it has like restorative properties or like is good for your skin. I don't know if that's true, but every time you go there, you're supposed to like slather it all over yourself and like take a picture. <laughs> that's literally all the photos. Yeah. <laughs> this is so cool. The water is beautiful there. Every, yeah. It looks so beautiful. Yeah, so. We're not taking another rock, are we? I didn't think about uh, it. I don't know. What do we have for a rock sample so far, Sebastian? Yeah. Sorry. We have. We have seven rocks. Uh, what depth was our last one? 
I do not have the information. Taylor well, took the sheet. What was the n number? <laughs> hmm? what, was the la what was the last rock number? Um, let's see. Last rock number was technically the nodule scoop. Okay, so before that. Before that, that was 77. 77. Just says 29 meters. Okay, well, 77 was at. That one says it's Wait, Jacob's oh, I see it, yeah. first. It's collection. kind of at the summit. We probably don't yeah. need another one. No, we don't. Thank you. Yep, just checking. I appreciate I that. I see lots of sampleable rocks. I love that. There I must be a challenge in Palau to manage an influx of tourists and trying to manage those resources. Yeah, so it definitely is a part of our like daily life and our economy it is one of the biggest you know um sources of money that comes yeah. in and actually for a time i think it was in 2015 2016 um there was a really big boom of tourists so we were receiving like something like a hundred thousand tourists a year and but there's only 200,000 people living on the island so yeah. a lot of things were getting overwhelmed mm -hmm. but then uh, in 2020, actually, we completely closed for a year just because our health infrastructure would not have been able to handle yeah. yep. um, a COVID outbreak. So we closed for a year and had no tourists, and then now we're still um, kind of getting back to the numbers that we were before. So it it was a good decision, obviously, for a health, like a public health standpoint, but a lot of people lost their jobs. So. Yeah. yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Were there COVID cases on the island? Yeah, so we slowly opened up around 2021, and that's when we first started to get like uh, our first cases. Yeah. And I think um, at its highest, we were maybe having like 10 to 20 cases a day, which for like our population was a lot. But luckily, our infrastructure was able to handle it, and also almost like 100% of people were vaccinated by that time. That's oh, okay. great. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah. So we were really lucky with the help of uh, WHO and the um, United States um, Department of Health as well came and like doctors and volunteers came and helped and um, vaccinated everybody. Yeah, so wow, that's great. Very few. I think we did unfortunately have some deaths, but it, it was like in the single digits. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Rich Nev. I'm looking at... I'm, I'm literally just going around yeah. Palau right now. <laughs> I feel like I'm on a tour. And I just found a store that is called Long Beach. And I was like, how cute. And it literally looks so cute. <laughs> Thank you. It's, so, it's really funny because my auntie actually, my cousin owns that store. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's so cute. I love it. Uh, yeah, it is the kind of place where you either know everyone yeah. or you're related to everyone. I think you'll... <laughs> you, if you go there, you could probably get a personal tour. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So That's so cool. We were discussing earlier how we mutually know someone from Palau. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are Palauans outside of Palau, too. There's a lot of Palauans living in Hawaii, actually. Huh. And all along the West Coast, and also in Guam, which is uh, like a nearby Micronesian island that's yeah. a little bit bigger. So I see also on from Google that y'all have a lot of like historical big like places. Mossal's tomb, Amalik Terrace. Met I am probably You're doing great on the pronunciation oh, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah. Metchi Betchu Oh you were. Yeah, yeah I'm probably not just great on that one. This one, this one <laughs> probably I was <coughs> Mechi Betchubel. Mechi Betchubel. Mechi Betchubel. Mechi veg ma e Mecca vegetable. Mecca vegetable. Mechi vegi Y'all have I'm to trying to <laughs> <laughs> I would need to see it. It's M E But actually the C H is pronounced like a guttural, so it's uh. Oh. You don't say me -a. Cha, it's uh. Me uh be uh ubu. Yeah, yeah, I'm lost now. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Hannah, you're doing amazing. Don't worry. I would have to see it written, I think, to know. But okay, okay. Yeah, so we have um, 
cultural sites, which are mm -hmm. the ones that you were talking about. So those are sort of the places where we believe um, like legendary demigods did Whoa. things on like our lands. And then we also have historical archeological sites. So we have a couple of um, uh, like the war did happen there, so there's like some tankers, some sites, especially in Peleliu, which was the site of a really big battle yeah. in wo World War Two. I don't it, know if you. That's not Whoa. on Palau, is it? Um, it's a part of Palau, but it's oh, okay. an island separate. It's a gotcha. it's yeah, its yeah. own island. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's considered a state of Palau. Yeah, Peleliu. There was a very large battle. Yeah. Uh, so they actually have a museum there dedicated donk. only to. Um, a lot of this, like the battle and the ar artifacts that are still found there. Uh -huh. Wow. This is literally such a fun little island. I love it. <laughs> Hannah, I love you have an open invitation anytime I you want to come. Now, here's a question that helps me determine if I would enjoy my time on Palau. <laughs> go okay, sure. go ahead. Uh, do you have a lot of influencers there? Oh my God. Like, you um, people... Not, doing <laughs> not resident ones uh, I mean, I that's what i mean the tourist ones i that's like a i've met a couple of me. them uh. and i mean it's it's just mostly people who are doing their you know like i'm visiting all the countries in the world thing yeah because we're not super i mean we're a good tourist des destination but there are like more affordable places more like easily accessible so um, normally, if there is an influencer, it's like he's on Ooh. his last leg of Thank his around-the-world tour. Right. Yeah. We actually, I, I was at our hometown bar, and I came in, and there was a guy filming with a GoPro, and everyone was like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. But yeah, not, I mean, few and far in between, and you can easily avoid them if you wanted to. Now, all these words with the N in the beginning, or is that silent? NG? Yes. No, it's a, it's like N, you pronounce Nuh? it. With okay. So what, what word are you looking at? I'm looking at nar, the Narnmau? Narnmau? Yes. Yeah. Those oh, are you got beautiful. it. Can you say Nard it again? Narnmau. Narnmau. Nard it's absolutely, like, I can't believe it. Someone put it as a 4.6 out of 5. Honestly, it looks like a 5 out of 5 to me. I don't know. <laughs> right. Don't reply agree. to their review. 5 yeah. out of 5. Well, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's a 5 out of 5. They're probably like, my stuff's in chewing gum. <laughs> One star. Oh, there's, uh, there's a site you can go to and watch the, look at the negative reviews for national parks. Oh, gosh. And it's like people going to Yellowstone and complaining because the bison weren't out at 10 a.m. Come on, people. Well, they give the Grand Canyon one star because it was foggy. Because it was foggy? Yeah. <laughs> Great snap. Oh, I think it might be the National Park Service that publishes those, actually. Please do a move, five zero meters, bearing three six zero. Okay, so I'll teach you guys one Palauan word. Yes, it's yes, pretty yes. easy. All right. It's the word for ocean. Mm. So it's spelled D A O B. D A O B. Yeah. So it's Daub. 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 Yeah, great. Awesome. Daub. 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 You said D A Daub. Yes, Daub. Nice. I've really loved my tour. Of Palau. <laughs> five out of five. Five out of five tour. <laughs> I actually was doing some research uh, for various reasons not long ago, and it uh, looks like flights come from, like, uh, I think uh, Guam and uh, Taiwan, maybe? Yeah, right now. Um, we used to have a lot more before COVID, but mm -hmm. I think those are the main ones that happen, like, every day, I think. I, the Taiwan is, like, three times a week, and then the Guam flight is every day. So to get to Honolulu, where'd you fly to? I flew through Guam. Yeah. yeah. 
I could have gone through Taiwan, um, but I think it's a little bit more expensive just because from oh. Guam, it's like Guam and then straight to Honolulu. <laughs> yeah. Is there a story between about the Japan Palau Friendship Bridge or is it just called the Friendship Bridge? Um, Man, I'm not sure how much if it was I know it's a big infrastructure project um, mm -hmm. in collaboration with Japan. Okay. I don't know how much of it was like paid for by them. Probably they funded a bit of it or like a large part of it. But yeah, it was in collaboration yeah. with Japan. I love. I just love the name Friendship Bridge. That's so cute. <laughs> like this place yeah. is literally so cute. Yeah, um, and that bridge was actually built after the original one collapsed. Um, and that was in the, I want to say the early 90s. So for a while, people were getting from the really big island, which has a lot of people on it, to the small center of commerce by ferry. Yeah. Wow. But now we have that bridge, so I cross that every day for work. Because oh, cool. I, live, I live in the bigger island and then work in the smaller island. Mm. I just realized the... Right under the vehicle. Nagar Katabal. Oh, go, go on, go on. Nuru Katabel and Nuru Tabel. I'm, I'm, I'm like right under yeah, the vehicle. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. They're you called the Rock Islands. Down. Yeah, that's so cool. That's yeah, so, cool. Rock so that's um, like limestone islands. There yeah. are similar ones. You might have seen similar ones like in Thailand. They have like really, really tall ones. Ours are kind of mm -hmm. shorter. Um, but they're limestone islands, and they have like beaches and reefs surrounding them, and that's also that's a really big tourist attraction. Yeah, that's the Milky Way that you were talking about. Yeah, when it's they in there. put it all over their skin, like a yeah. mud bath. <laughs> yeah, the limestone. You can uh, do that in Iceland as well. Another yeah. reason for me to go to Iceland. Long trip from Palau, but. <laughs> yeah. When a Kara, lot of stuff. When Kara's on here, I'm gonna have to do a tour of. Guam, Guam with her. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Guam's got a, a interesting history. Cool place. Yeah, I like Guam too. I like Southern Guam. That's the more like rural area. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Where's your favorite like beach or place to hang out in Palau? Because so I'm looking at a map and I, I'll <laughs> look it up. So I really like this uh, rock island called. Oh my God! Why am I forgetting the name? That's a weird name. <laughs> no, it's not that. <laughs> Um, oh, it's called Us. Us. Forgot to say how it's spelled. Us, so N G C H U S. N G C H U S. You said N or M G? C H U S. N G C H U S, yeah. Us. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Beach in Palau. So that one's oh. really nice. It's a. a uh, Rock Island, similar to the others, but it's nice because it has, um, like, the entrance is kind of not open to the ocean. Like, it has another Rock Island in front of it, mm -hmm. so it's sort of sheltered. And then you can also walk out to the other side. Tori has a map pulled up. <laughs> you can also walk out to the other side if you want to see, like, the sunset or the sunrise. People camp there. Yeah, they have, like, barbecue grills and stuff. It's it has beautiful. really nice snorkeling. Wow. The color of the water just looks so amazing. Yeah. We're coming off the summit cone here. Um, we're just going to go due north, basically, and uh, it's going to be downhill a bit here, but we'll see if we can find something to look at. It's pretty small, but that's home. Got 15 minutes. Well, I love it. <laughs> and I'm actually really blessed because uh, where I work, we do a lot of field work, and I've been able to dive like in a lot of places that normally wouldn't be uh, like dove on because wow. we do like um, coral reef surveys, basically, and like uh, regular monitoring of all of like these different reefs that you guys mm -hmm. see. So I've been able to dive on like a lot of those different places. I was muted. I just said that's great. Is the 
field work, field work one of your favorite parts of the job? Uh, I would say yes and no, just because we sometimes have like a really heavy duty schedule. So we would be diving like three or four times a week. It's tiring. And that can, yeah, it gets really tiring. But um, once after a while, if you're then in the office for like months on end, you're like, oh man, this is boring. <laughs> yeah. It's nice that you have that, um, you have both. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. Um, sorry, I did not expect to just come in here and talk about Palau. No, all that was time, great. But Thank you. <laughs> the I Palau Tourism it. Authority thanks you. <laughs> I love it. That was awesome. Thanks. Yeah, and everyone is welcome anytime. Um, it's a beautiful place. Everyone's really friendly. Everyone, I mean, um, everyone speaks pretty good English. Like, it's one of our national languages, so wouldn't have any problem getting around. Shout out to the store Long Beach. <laughs> Shout out to Long Beach. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna take this clip, Hannah, and then show it to my cousin. Okay, please. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Are you gonna help with recovery, Elsa? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I need to check. watch. In, in a week, Hannah's gonna be like camping outside on the street. Like, can you let me in now? <laughs> no, in Long Beach, yeah. Okay. Well, anytime you wanna come to Long Beach, I'm there. There you go. <laughs> so you can come stay with me. <laughs> Okay, guys, okay. I'm gonna let Malia back on here. Yeah, yeah thanks. Nice. Bye, Bye. Bye. That was cool. Mm -hmm. I learned so much. Now we're just looking at a field of pillow lavas, pillow basalt. Tori, you're shaking your head and you're agreeing with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. I still feel not super confident in identifying lobate flow, but pillow. Yeah, I, I definitely easy. agree with Hannah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I love reassurance. Yeah. Now you guys need that level of confidence about crinoids and um, the zingots. Mm. The zingo. I'm guessing that that's a crinoid down there. I agree. Sebastian says yes. <laughs> to be fair, that's an easy one because it's a bright yellow. Okay, okay. Seems like that crinoid's everywhere in the last two sea mounts. Mike? Actually, where is Singapore in relation to uh, Palau? Singapore is the southern end of the Malaysian Peninsula. Okay, no, I was just look, looking on the map. That's Fish, cool. Uh, just south, uh, well, not just, but Kuala Lumpur. Sebastian, that's a brittle star up there, too? Yep. The What's pink that? ones. Mm -hmm. What's that there's some hydroids on growing there? on it. Looks like there's a little. You guys see that? That guy. That guy. An isopod? I'm guessing. That was me just guessing. Oh, that's a chitin. A chitin? Chitin. Chitin. Deep sea roly poly. Hmm. Deep sea. Kite into shallow water. I don't see them much in the deeper. Are they common in the deep sea? There are chitons in the deep sea. They're just not well studied. S squat lobster. I thought chitin was uh, like what made up shells, like on scorpions. That's a uh, different, different, same word, different. Huh. Okay. Trying to zoom out as slow as I can so Jake can get a little bite to eat over there. I gotta have my Oreos. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> I haven't even opened mine yet. 
Although, oh, yeah, I usually wait till we're about a week out. Yeah, I can see how I can get confused with an isopod. I, yeah, an isopod. Well, isopods are more closely related to land roly polies. Okay. Well, kinds are mollusks. We've got nine more minutes bottom time. Nine minutes. Last time we saw that really awesome jelly. Yeah. That looked like an acorn, but I don't remember its name. It was, I think it was a helmet jellyfish. Well, like, so my idea is a helmet jellyfish, but the morphology, morphology didn't quite match for me. The thing for Virginia sent us looked very similar, but it had thicker set tentacles. Oh, she sent, she sent, I forgot. Yeah, it might be related to that, just without the thicker tentacles, but the helmet jelly looks a little bit too off for me to be that same species. Yeah, now that I'm looking at it, I can understand. I just looked at this and I'm like, that, it was just really weird how the tenant, because the one that you had, like the, hold up. The Virginia set? Yes. It looked, the tentacles looked different. It looked different, but the overall bell looked exactly the same. Yes. Oh, I don't, I forgot what she, I'll find it. But deep sea. It'll make it easier. Oh. Looks like we might have the, ne <coughs> the next launch, which we haven't done many of, if any. Yeah, we haven't done any yet. Oh, We're going to have blue water time. Mm -hmm. Blue water time at 4 a.m. Yep. We're going to be lively. Oh, <laughs> I'm so... <laughs> I'm going to bring a bunch of candy for Hannah just to make it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be okay with you bringing one of those chip, what, chip uh, famous the, Amos? Yeah. <laughs> We're down to one left. It's in the emergency oh. drawer up here. Oh. Oh, then never mind. Well, it could be an emergency. We can yeah. split it. Her on, her on, the emergency rations this early. Her on low blood sugar is kind of an emergency. I'll be okay. Or we can okay. all try cool. my French bread diet. I've already converted one of you. Yeah. <laughs> He got me. Um, so you said about nine minutes on bottom left? Well, now it's six. <laughs> I'm just curious, because I just had this funny thought. Could Hercules potentially like go like in a loop? Could it go in a loop? What do you mean in a loop? Like, could like, it a like, like a plane? No. Yeah, okay. I was just, I just wanted no, to No, because the, um, the, the the ballast is at the bottom and the float's on the mm. top. It couldn't, okay. it couldn't flip over. We can give it a try curious. here in a little bit. <laughs> I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> no, I was just curious. I just imagined it doing a little loop. And no. then I was like, that's not, that's no way. <laughs> Jake, what do you think? Uh, what was that? <laughs> Can you do a quick loop? <laughs> like <laughs> upside down and like a... <laughs> he just laughs. Uh, not a, to. not asking you to, but could Herc do that? My answer was no, but I don't know no. for sure. I didn't think so, but... Not with its current configuration. Not in its current configuration. Got it. All right. I might start driving to the end of the tether. Oh, that's going to wrap up this dive, I think. Lots of information, lots of samples, Turn lots of imagery. Of Tito. Uh, drive to the end. Lots of time to the surface. You still have room for one more big thing to happen. <laughs> you never know. Okay, you have four minutes. We have the water column too. True that. There could be white tip sharks. Those sharks have been around. Yep. For a bit now. 
Leo can um, conjure up some more wish lists time in the yacht. Wish list, ah, wish list items in the meantime. Wish list items of like what we want to see? Yes. Well, before this dive in. See, the thing is, like, I don't even know what type of biology we could see, because usually every time I'm, like, surprised by whatever I see <laughs> biology-wise. Sebastian, do you mean in general or at this specific location? Um, in general, but if you can conjure it at this specific location, that'd be cool, too. Sea star. Hmm. In general? I know it's not possible, <laughs> but a whale. All right. no, that's fully possible. I thought it wasn't whale season. Where did you start coming up? There are uh, other whales, like the beaked whales. Too late. Okay. Well, I, would, see a I beaked would like whale, to see a that whale. That would be ex extremely exciting because they're usually extremely shy. Aww. They usually like to dive to the bottom, too, and there's hard bottom here. I want RVs to see off bottom. I want to see a whale shark. Copy that. But, uh, that might be closer to the surface of that. Oh, are we coming up now? Yes. We are okay. off bottom. Okay. We we have to go a little bit slower on part of our parts of our ascent to kind of baby the winch. So ah, gotcha. We have to kind of account for that. Ken wants us to go slow on the flanges. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'll s no, I can slow down. Looks like we're losing some of our sediment core. Or it could just be stuff that fell near it. Baja California looks like the place to go see whale sharks. Oh, hmm. uh, yeah, there's also a bay down in uh, Baja California where the uh, whales go to uh, have their offspring called Dylan's? Something? No? Can't. Have to think of it. Uh, Camp Wire. No way. Scanlan's Bay. They have whale sharks in Cozumel and Cancun. I've been so many times, and I'm so upset that I didn't know that. It's um. only certain times of the year when uh, when the corals are spawning that they go there. I think it's in the winter. I could have that backwards. I wonder if whale sharks know how loved they are. <laughs> I'm sure they do. On my list, I want to see a gold for eel. I forgot about that one. Okay. Well, I would like to see one of the baby Dumbos. Baby Dumbo. I liked, I liked our big Dumbo, but I would love to see the little baby, like, squ squish the, uh, you made me ink, little <laughs> girl. Oh, this is a team for. Oh my gosh! Can we get a zoom in if possible? Ah! I love little aliens. <laughs> little aliens. <laughs> So shimmery. It's so pretty. It's it's just beautiful. Beautiful. Bridge nap. Can you do all stop, please? Are we rising to the surface? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the ascent rate's gonna be about 20. Alright, so maybe we should 
say 18 average, 16. How much? Nav. Can we just stream forward at the heading of the ship? 0 0.2 knots. Yep. Thank you. That's not our sediment spilling out, is it? What was that? Um, just looking at that, what's coming out of the things next to the CT, that's the disease. Yeah, thing. it does look like it. Yeah, I should note that. Um, maybe we could give it a tap in, pilot. The, yeah. Oh, this gasket's gone. Oh, it's at the top, I see it. Letting you know we are expecting a uh, recovery at 20 hundred. Thank you. Twenty. Okay, so at eight. I think I told you about a brand a little while ago that made like clothing and like yeah. sunsuits. Yeah, I never showed it to you. Yeah, okay, let me pull it up on the computer so we can look. I know they have tiger shark stuff, but I think they also may have manta rays. Yes, water lust. You can shop by cost. So here's all of the different options. Eagle race, spotted eagle race. My bad. But yes, tiger shark research. I wonder if we'll see those sharks. Yeah. I saw them last time. Mm -hmm. So it's fully possible. We had a really good view of them too. There were two of them and a whole bunch of fish swimming around. Can you remind us again what were those fish? Um, Pilot fish? Pilot fish, and then there are trevallis, and then there are a couple mahis. And there was opello, which is mackerel. Mackerel. Apparently, while we were eating dinner, they saw some of the sharks. Mm -hmm. Oh, I saw one as well. I just looked over and it was there. Wow, I didn't see it when I looked. Sad. Probably still there, so honestly, there's a good chance we'll see them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you can see on the little thing where Hercules is. The A-frame? I mean, yes. There are a lot of birds. You can see them. Yeah. It makes me so happy. There's so many birds on the ship right now. 
I mean, I, well, I would be scared. Nothing like what we've had when Jake was on that one time. Oh, with the Palmyra incident? Yeah. Can y'all share what happened? Well, there Palmyra were incident for a reason. <laughs> there uh, were, I don't think, think that, uh, certainly hundreds of them on the vessel. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I heard that they uh, did not exactly clean up after themselves. Yeah, yeah. it's strange that seabirds, for some reason, when they land on vessels, frequently get sick. Sebastian, do you have any tips for any young students we have, maybe like high schoolers, about what they could be doing um, right now to kind of start a possible career in marine science or just ocean exploration in general? That is a fantastic question. Um, my first recommendation is definitely take your science classes. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty j base one. Um, what I did in high school is I volunteered at the aquarium, like almost every weekend. That's just me. I over I overdid it, but like going to the aquarium, volunteer at the aquarium a couple days a month might be do, do a lot for your base foundational understanding of the ocean. There are a lot. Um, if you don't have an aquarium around, just volunteering in something related to nature or animals is going to be helpful. Um, even like taking like a chemistry club or a biology club is very useful as well. Um, there are pro summer programs for high schoolers if you look into them online. I believe they're offered through the NSF as well as other independent programs. We're very like kind of summer programs where you can go research at a lab mm -hmm. and start do a research project in a lab as a high school student, or you can go on these cool trips to observe nature and whatnot and do science. Um, there's a lot of different little programs depending on where you are, and I highly recommend looking them up as mm -hmm. well as you can. Um, unfortunately, I do not think there are any currently any programs for um, high school students to be at sea anymore, unfortunately, that I know of. Um, but the opportunity to start that, able to apply for those positions, soon, start as soon as you're a freshman in college. So definitely, as soon as you get into college, keep up with like trying to do research, keep yourself active in a project or volunteering, anything helps. Yeah, I know, Hannah, uh, we've talked about before, like when you got to college, like when you started your undergrad, how did you start doing research? Like, how do you do that? So basically, my profess my intro professor she, the first day of class, she put a list of professors that were looking for undergrads to help with their research. And she put their name and their email address on the board and she explained what each of their studies were. So Sam Bentley was one of them. And um, Dr. Sam Bentley, he was one of them. And uh, so was Dr. Suniti, which was, it's not, to me it sounded cooler to do planetary science than sedimentology so that's why I chose planetary science instead but my friend who is in Arizona he chose sedimentology so he was with um, Dr. Sam, ben Sam and did Bentley. you start research like your very first semester no because it was a lot for me to even reach out to him I'm not gonna lie yeah. I literally was like I know nothing I'm a freshman like I'm not gonna contribute anything to whatever he's studying. Cause I was like, I also know nothing about Mars. I was like, nothing. So I literally, basically a lot of my friends and even my classmates and my parents, they were like, you know, you should just try it. Like just reach out to him. And I, they're like, you can do it. And I was like, okay. 
And so then I emailed him after the first semester because I was like, okay, now I have a semester of geology because I've never taken a geology mm -hmm. class in my life. So I was like, now I have a semester of geology. I feel more confident in myself. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll reach out to him. So I reached out to him before the end of the first semester. And then I started working with him the next semester. What did your email sound like? Like, what did you write? <laughs> it was like, hello, dear Dr. Sunidi. I, <laughs> I am Hannah Parody, and I am a freshman, at, freshman geology major. And Dr. Luther, who is the teacher who talked about him, Dr. Luther posted your, posted on the whiteboard, wrote on the whiteboard that you were looking for undergrads and I was hoping that I could be a part or help with whatever you're working on. I would love to have the experience and I, after taking, I think my uh, first semester, I was like, I probably said something along the lines of, I feel like I know enough of the basics and I'm ready to learn and I mm -hmm. learn pretty quickly. And he literally emailed me back and he was like, sure. And he gave me a date and he was like, meet me Friday at whatever. And I was like, that works for me. <laughs> and so then I met him the first Friday of the my second semester. And the nicest thing was he literally, like, because I knew nothing about Mars, right? He would have these sessions with me like a few times a week where he would talk about like the history of Mars or like what he's working on and just like the basics for me. And it was so nice. And I felt so, like I felt so welcomed, yeah, even though I didn't, important. I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So I'm really thankful for that. And same with when I went to the Antarctica one, I had another semester under my, that, cause that was my sophomore year. And it was my professor actually of my 1202 class that he wanted me to come work with him after I took the class. So then I was, and then unfortunately COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So then that was canceled and that was really sad. Oh, and then that, I didn't, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, so it didn't do that. And then we couldn't really do any lab, like lab work for me my junior year either. Cause my senior year was the only other time that I was like working on a project mm -hmm. because, and that was another thing that was so scary for COVID was just the lack of experience and like hands-on, even yeah. with those petrological samples that I was going through, mm -hmm. like all of that that I had to do was online. Like mm -hmm. I didn't do it in person, which which is not. Were you on campus in junior year or did you stay in home? All of my geology classes my junior year, except for one of them because there weren't a lot of people in it, were online. But I did have a lab for petrology, but it was only like two and a half hours and it was once a week and we couldn't go to office hours or extra time yeah. because of COVID. So it was really like condensed like class. And I also, that's another thing I highly suggest becoming like, don't be afraid to reach out to your TAs. Yeah. Like literally I love my TAs from my petrology class because if it wasn't for them, I don't think I would have done as well as I did because yeah. they were tremendously helpful for me. And a lot of geology, especially upper level geology, there aren't a lot of TAs. Mm -hmm. So every time that you are offered the, you have a TA for your class, literally just go to them. I, that, that was also where I learned a lot. And I really, the TAs were the ones that were like grading. So they were really lenient on like grading me. And also they would like give me points back whenever I would like explain what I was thinking and why I put down that answer. And he was like, okay, I can see like where you were coming from. I can give you some points back on that because I understand what you were, you were thinking. Mm -hmm. And so I've had that happen like multiple times on tests. Mm -hmm. So really just like going out and yeah, if you get your test score back, just go meet with the professor and go over your test with them and they might give you points back. That happened to me a ton of times and every point counts for your 
for, at least for me, for my GPA, especially since I knew I wanted to go to grad school. Yeah. I was like, my GPA needs to be high. But yeah, and you've been a TA before, yeah? Yes, I have. I have been a TA, and it was so much fun. It felt like when I was little and I would play like teacher, like with my siblings. Mm -hmm. It felt like that, but obviously at a, like college level. But that was the first time that I ever did some type of teaching, and I talked to you about it. Yeah. And it was really difficult because I know I I've talked to you. Yeah. I had a similar experience when I TA'd, like, and these were for like intro chemistry classes. Yeah, mine was intro Lecture geology. Lecture and lab would be so far apart, so like they Same. would have not had any lessons on like stoichiometry, and then they'd yeah. come to me, and we'd be doing labs that required them to be able to do that math, and I'd be standing up there in the pre lab being like. Yeah, now you have to teach them. Yes. And they told us, they told us, they were like, you're, you're not going to allow, like, you're not going to be, you're not going to teach anything. Like, you're just restating what you've, they've learned in class. And I'm like, wrong, <laughs> wrong, because wrong. literally what you were saying about the stoichiometry, you're going to have to teach them how to do it because they don't know how to do it. So mm -hmm. then you're doing the teacher's job. It, it was, it was frustrating because I had to do that for a few of mine, which is fine. But I was like, I wasn't expecting. Like, it felt like I was being thrown to the wolves. Yeah. Like, to teach something. Yeah. So, one I of think the... Th yeah. It's different for me because it was still hard, but also I was, like, you know, wanting to be a teacher and yeah. wanting to teach that. So, it was good kind of, like, practice. Mm. Um, and that wasn't something that I, like, was not required to do for my major. I just kind of, like, went out of my way to find those opportunities. And I'm glad I did because, similar to you with COVID, like, I went to one of my field placements for literally a day. And then we went home for spring break and then we just like never came back because COVID. So then like I lost a whole like internship and then I started student teaching and I was like, I've never taught a lesson just like by myself to high <gasps> schoolers. Cause like my internships before that were with elementary school students. So I did student teaching, but it was hybrid. So like the max number of kids I had in the room with me was like 14 and then like fast forward to my first day of teaching on my own I had like 32 kids in the class <laughs> and that was a very quick um just like learning curve yeah um that's intimidating too it it was it oh definitely was but yeah that was like for us that class where we were supposed to have that internship it turned into like us being on zoom me and my classmates and my professor and we'd had to like practice teaching each other our lessons and then we'd have to sit there and act like we did not know the answers to the questions and like yeah and that's not really helpful no it was not not helpful at all not a great time yeah that was one thing about covid that was really scary was like i was comparing myself to like older students that had like those classes right and i was like how am i supposed to like i feel like i should know all this stuff right and i feel like i'm at a disadvantage because of like not having those like hands-on experiences so yeah it it was really hard for me because I was like I really didn't think that I was going to be able to like get in for some reason I was like so worried that I didn't think I was going to get into grad school because of my like um online online courses because I was like in comparison with somebody who didn't do undergrad during COVID like they they probably know more than me and more like hands-on than me so I was really worried, but I guess one thing I had to remind myself, I was like, it was global. I was like, yeah. everybody else was like in that same position that you are in. So yeah, it was just a lot, like I would just worry about a lot of things. And what was it like applying for grad school? Do you have tips for anyone that is maybe at that yeah. point? Yeah. So if you're applying to grad school, the first thing that I would do was look up when their deadlines are because especially if you have certain schools in mind, I would look up their deadlines. So a lot of them range from like November. I saw the earliest like being November and then the latest I was seeing like February, like early February or mid February. But yeah, so first step would be if you have schools in mind, check their deadlines. Also, start getting your recommendation letters. There's usually like two to three that you need. And so again, that's really good to have those conversations with your professors like in office hours, just for them to like get to know you. 
And even like in the undergrad research, the whoever your mentor is or advisor is that you're mm -hmm. undergrad researching with, like have them write your rec letter. And um, the another thing for grad school, make sure you talk with the advisor before you commit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a conversation with them. And also check, at, reach out to whoever the grad um, program person, head of the grad program is, and ask them, or at least what I did, I, I would ask them for, is there any like financial aid or scholarships that could like help me? Because I was coming from out of state mm -hmm. to California. So I reached out and I asked about that. And he answered back that there was a scholarship and I applied to it and I got it. And then he also worked with me to, um, get me in-state tuition. Wow. Yeah, it was, it, and that was all because I reached out it to asked, the head yeah. of, because if not, I wouldn't have known. The other thing that I'd say is, um, it, it's way better to like reach out to individual professors at schools that you want and like see if they are hiring grad students for a specific project that they have a grant on. Because if, if you connect with a professor and then apply to the grad school, it's, it's a way easier path to get in than if you just cold apply, because they might let you in, but have no professor or project for you. So if you can come in under a specific professor, they may even have funding for you on, on various grants. So um, yeah, if you're looking to go to grad school, I would start e e by even step one might be reaching out to professors that are doing work that interests you that are on the, on the university's page. Yeah. Because that's what I did for, well, once I reached out to the head of the grad department, he was like, oh, who do you, like, plan on working with? And I told him, Dr. Balbus. And he was like, I know she's accepting students. You should reach out to her. And I was like, okay, thank you for letting me know that she's accepting students. So then I reached out to her, and then we set a Zoom, I set up a Zoom, and then we, we talked for, like, an hour. Was that before your application? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was before my application. And does she do Igneous stuff? Mm, she does geochronology, but oh, right. okay. it ranges, it includes igneous. Yeah, okay. She also does cosmo, cosmogenic, cosmogenic nuclides, cosmogenic nuclides, I think. Now I need to look up to make sure I, <laughs> I I'm so sorry if I butchered that. Cause, wait, doctor. Yes. Cosmogenic nuclides. But yeah, grad school. Like I said, I knew I was gonna go to grad school when I was mm -hmm. a freshman. So wait, what is? No, 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 no. Google. Did you visit the campus or the area before you died? Nope. <laughs> no, I did not. And I I looked up like photos of it and then I what I just did with Palau, like looking around Google Maps, yeah. that's exactly <laughs> what I did. And I was like, this is a tour. And yeah, I basically like that. That's, but I I literally looked through. I went through. I looked. I looked up a map of the U.S. and then I went through each state and I looked up geology college, like geology department college, colleges with a geology department in each state. And then I read. I was like reading everything. Cosmologic. But yeah, that's that's. When did you first start your research during, like, for these schools? Like, was that your junior or senior year of undergrad? Senior. Because I thought that, so the whole time, I thought I was going to undergrad at LSU. So I wasn't even searching. Because I was just <laughs> like, oh, I'm just going to go to LSU's grad school. But then my mentor was like, at the time, he was, he was saying I should probably leave LSU. And um, I was like, what? And so when he said that, I was like, okay. So then I told my parents about it because I, I had to let them know because they thought I was going to LSU the whole time. And I told them that I'm looking, I'm looking at like um, out of state schools. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, 
you're going to have to do all the work for it, and you're going to have to figure <laughs> And I'm like, that's what I planned well, on doing. I'm just telling you that that's what I'm doing now. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, okay. And then now they're, they're always like, we're so proud of you. <laughs> da, 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 da. And I'm like, mm, yeah. See, I was like, see, I have it. I have it under control. But, yeah, that, that was a really easy decision for me to go, like, to leave, too. Mm -hmm. I was, I was ready. I was ready to move on from Louisiana, especially, like, having lived there, and I went to school there for four years, so I was, I was excited to move on. And even though, whenever I tell, like, anybody or, like, any of my friends in Louisiana, I'm like, yeah, I, like, I live in California, and they're like, oh, who do you, like, do you know anybody there? Like, when I was first going, and yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't know anybody. And they were like, so you're just moving to, like, a new place not knowing anybody? And I was like, well, I am moving in with a roommate. They were like, do you know your roommate? And I was like, no. <laughs> no. No, we just met, mm -hmm. like, on CSULB's, like, find a roommate, mm -hmm. like, thing. I just got so lucky. My roommate is amazing. That's she was good. A, she was an art major, so it was completely <laughs> different than me. And that was she was one of the the first people that whatever I would do a presentation, like a PowerPoint presentation for geology, I would do it with her because she had no idea what I was talking about. And so I could gauge like how much info I could put on these slides because I think mm -hmm. one of my classes I had geography majors also, so they. Not that they didn't know anything about geology, but it was it was enough that like I needed to know like how much do they know. Right. So it was I, I was really thankful to have her name's Brooke, have Brooke like be my audience. And I was like nice. So it was really I was really thankful for how it it all worked out for me and my parents couldn't believe how much it worked out for me. They're like, you were you're so lucky. And I was like, yeah, I am. I got really lucky with my roommate and just like how it all went down. And now I have, now I met wonderful professors like Dr. Val, Dr. Conrad, yeah. my mentor, Dr. Valdez. And they're just like all the most like friendly, intelligent, giving mm -hmm. professors ever. I love them. Oh. I love them so much. I hope Val heard that. <laughs> yeah. She's probably getting the lab. Actually, I have no idea what she's doing. She's probably doing something smart, <laughs> if I had to guess. But, um, yeah, it was it was awesome. But wait, I have to ask you about Lumbee. Yeah. yeah. So can you explain that? Yeah. So I'm... Lumbee, meaning I'm from the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. So we are one of the state recognized tribes in the state. Um, we're the largest tribe east of the Mississippi River. Wow. Um, and we're very unique um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, the area that Lumbees are from is in southeastern North Carolina. And so the Lumber River kind of runs through that area and the Lumber River Basin is kind of, um, I guess swampy is like the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an area in the state where, you know, there were a lot of natives from like different tribes, different groups that kind of uh, sought refuge in that place because that was a place that a lot of people weren't really trying to settle. Um, so we have a very unique history. Um, that part of North Carolina, like, was tri-racially segregated. So like my grandparents, like, um, grew up going to schools for native students only. There are schools for like white students, schools for black students. Um, and honestly, like there are a lot of people even in the state of North Carolina that like don't know we exist or that we're mm -hmm. there, but we're a pretty big group. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we're uh, mainly in like Robeson County, but there are a few other surrounding counties in that area that a lot of Lumpies are in. Wow. Yes. And this might be silly, but when you say native, do you mean Native American? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's not a silly question. Um, no? Are you, like, what, uh, can I ask, like, what percentage? Like, yes. are you... So I'll say, too, um, we get asked that question a yeah. lot. <laughs> um, Figures. Um, I, like, both of my parents are Lumbee. Okay. Um, 
both grew up in Robeson County. Um, my dad was in the Army, so like I never lived inside of Robeson County, but we go home very frequently. Um, but yes. That's cool. It's cool to be able to, well, like we've heard from Malia and the others, it's, it's nice to be able to trace back like your tribal lineage and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I'll say that like we have, you know, kind of a unique uh, story. Like we do not have our language anymore and like have not for right. like a very, very long time. Like kind of the first documentation of natives in that area or natives in that area being discovered, we'll say, um, were written down as like uh, English speaking Indians like in that area. So like we have huh. not had our language for like a very long time. and. There are a lot of, you know, theories about, like, some of the other tribes that we kind of descended from because there are, like, bits and pieces of um, culture, but also, like, a lot of our Lumbee, like, last names, like our surnames, you'll find them in other tribes throughout the state of North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina. So, like, Hunt is a very common Lumbee last name. Chavis is my mom's last name. That's also very common. Oxendine, Locklear. Um, it makes it very easy to, like spot another lom normally i can like yeah. see them and recognize them or hear them and i i do not really have an accent um and that's mainly because i did like not grow up in robison county but like normally if i hear someone talk i might like turn around and be like oh my god that's did, cool. your, <laughs> did your parents keep their accent um they kind of are able to like kind of turn it on and off um they like when my dad uh he went to college at unc pembroke and Pembroke is kind of the, it's a school in Robinson County in Pembroke, North Carolina, um, where like a lot of Lumbees go. So he went there and then went to the army and like their first duty station was like Kentucky. And that's like the first time either of them had really like left that area. So like they've kind of moved around a lot. Um, and it'll come out, especially if they're like on the phone with like family members. Yeah. Um, but it's not like as prominent. What kind, is it like Southern? Or yeah, southern accent, but it has like a very distinct sound that's like different. Even for like other people in North Carolina, it's like, where are you from? And like, um, very specific dialect, but also like words that like. I want to look it up now. Yes, there are some videos on YouTube called like Lumbee English. There's like a Twitter account that's like, I think it's like Lumbee vocab or something like that, where they just like post little sayings. For like non lums to try and like understand and decipher um but that yes that's something where sometimes like even when i'm like at home um and when i say like at home home i kind of mean like in robson county around other lumbies like they'll hear me talk and be like where are you from <laughs> why do you sound like that do you have like certain um, holidays or ceremonial days that you folks um, celebrate as a community as a lumbi community i can't didn't hear the beginning of your question. Oh, okay. So do you folks have the Lumbi um, tribe? Mm -hmm. Do you have like certain holidays or ceremonial days where you all gather together? Yeah. So I actually, um, there are a lot of powwows that happen in North Carolina through like for multiple tribes in the month of September. So I feel like I've missed like so many <laughs> being out here. Um, and We'll have a fall powwow. I don't remember when exactly. It may have been in September too, but um, in the summertime we have Lumbee homecoming, and there are Lumbee communities in Baltimore and in Detroit, um, and that's kind of like my grandparents' generation because they kind of moved up there for work, um, to work in like factories and different plants like that. So in the summertime we'll have Lumbee homecoming, which is normally during like the week of the 4th of July, but it's kind of like a week long celebration. Um, so we'll have a powwow, usually that's on like one of the very last days, but like for that whole week, um, there are vendors set up selling like jewelry, um, crafts, any like kind of clothing, things like that. Um, and then food, we have like um, a few food items that are kind of special, mm -hmm. um, like grape ice cream. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> We eat, like, very, 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 like, I don't know, like, when you think about, like, southern food. Um, so, like, one of my favorite things to eat that, like, I do not cook as well as, like, my mom or any of my <laughs> grandmas or aunts, but, like, collards, I love eating green. So, like, something that's now become kind of, like, a thing at Lumby Homecoming is collard wraps, which are almost like an egg roll, essentially. And Ooh, that so um, we'll put 
I don't know if y'all are familiar with like Chow Chow mm-hmm. at all. Um, I'm gonna look it up right now. Yeah, so it's essentially, <laughs> I think I was telling you, Malia, like I love vinegary based stuff. Yeah. So Chow yeah. Chow is like, not necessarily like a slaw, uh, but it's like what pickled relish. Yeah, essentially, like you can put that on top of your collards or oh, turnips or other yummy. stuff. So, like, they'll make a collard wrap and then you can like dip it in chow chow and i personally oh, so chow chow is like not my favorite topping um, <laughs> my dad loves to eat it but i'll i'm fine with just like plain vinegars mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. kind of so do you mean you, you said collard wrap is it like a lettuce wrap where things are inside a no, collard no it's like right? fried oh. oh yes got it and they're delicious oh, delicious it sounds like, yeah. or they're Anything also fries delicious uh collard sandwiches so like when y'all think of cornbread what do you think oh. of I think, well, like there's the two different types cake. to me. Mm-hmm. There's the cake type, and there's the not cake type. <laughs> and it's, um, we, uh, m- my mom makes it, and it's almost gooey. Mm. I don't know how to, it's like, mm. it's it's a different texture. I think it's, hold on. What's your type? So we, <laughs> yeah, we, we make, <laughs> so cornbread, and this is also something where, like, depending on where we lived, my mom would have to like bring maybe cornmeal with us because she wouldn't be able to find like the specific type that she would use um so like we norm we don't like sometimes there'll be like the fluffy cornbread but like for lumbies and this is not really unique to like just lumbies in that area of north carolina we like fry our cornbread and it's like very thin and crispy Mm, that sounds great it is like a corn tortilla kind of yeah a little sweet Um, no not really sweet Mm. Um, and yes, I forget that sometimes like the fluffy cornbread is sweet. Yeah, so yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's not like sweet, sweet like a cake, but it usually has a little sugar in it. Yeah, yeah. This, and this, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. No, you're good. So yes, like flat, crispy. Sounds great. Not really sweet. Yeah. Still probably some sugar in it. And so like another thing at homecoming that's like really popular. People are very creative, and you know, natives like our culture is forever evolving. We are contemporary people. Like yeah, things change. For sure. Like my ancestors were not even collard wraps and collard sandwiches <laughs> but like um you can take like two pieces of crispy cornbread put collards in there and then like our collards and like a lot of our greens and like just vegetables in general um when they're cooked they're cooked in fat back grease mm. do you mm. know what fat back is no no okay so this is also it's interesting for me sometimes because like i have like friends from like this part of like north carolina or other places in the south that are like yes this is like a southern thing but fatback is like pork comes from a pig. Yeah. And you just like fry it up. It's like bacon grease, right? Kinda. Yeah. And you can like eat the fat back after it's fried and like, you know, super not healthy for you, but it's <laughs> extremely tasty. And it's kind of like before anything else is cooked, like you gotta have the fat back grease first. Mm. So it's like something that's So everything just else kind can of, be cooked in it. Yeah. yeah. So it like sits out for you to kind of like nibble on before mm. dinner time which that like you know great. it's a side <laughs> item everything and you're describing sounds really good yes. so back back to the collard sandwich this is part yeah. of it so two pieces of cornbread collards fat back because the collards are cooked in fat back grease and i'll be honest i do not like frying fat back and like it took me a while when i was in college to find a grocery store that carried it and then once <laughs> i found it i was like dang it now i don't have an excuse to like not make it for myself no. um, <laughs> but yes those are a big big so at homecoming um and then like one of my favorite kind of when meals when i think about home my like perfect spread um we eat something called paster and it's almost like chicken and dumplings mm. um but we put like yellow food coloring in it <laughs> and just eat it yellow and like there are some families that eat it just like plain white and that's always such an interesting thing because, like, I know for so many, like, especially, like, young kids, it's like, I don't want that. Like, it makes, it does not taste any different. Right. But the color is, like, huh. important. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But essentially, like, paster. Um, and normally, like, you'll cook, like, an entire, like, chicken breast. And then you'll take the broth to, like, make the paster in or, like, pastry. Um, some families will call it. And then you'll use that chicken to make, like, chicken salad and then have, like, some vegetables on the side could it be cabbage and like my dad really likes eating cabbage with like corned beef so like i'll eat that's corned beef with cabbage yeah. yeah 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 that's an irish thing too yeah. yeah and so greens like that and then something else that i realized is like i guess not super common we call like 
tomatoes and rice. Tomatoes and rice, huh? Essentially just rice cooked in like tomato sauce. Mm, that sounds great too. Yes. Whoa, that's, and yeah, that's different. Yes, and then so like cornbread on the side, fat back on the side, um, maybe some more vegetables. And I was telling you, Malia, like um, one of my favorite snacks, and like I will literally just like crave this at night before I go to bed, but just like cut up some cucumbers, put them in vinegar, some pepper. And like my family will also do like tomatoes because that's usually what was like growing in the garden. Um, and I'm not the biggest fan of tomatoes, but like I love cucumbers and putting them in vinegar is essentially a pickle, so. Yeah. Good stuff. But yes, mm. yes. And so at homecoming, like a lot of people come to like eat. Um, we have some like lumpy like entrepreneurs that are making all kinds of like, I don't know, shirts, stickers, like all kinds of stuff. Um, so that'll be there, but also like just like jewelry, um, and, oh, I'm forgetting, like, what sometimes people call, like, the Lumpy Met Gala. Um, oh. uh, we have our pageants. <laughs> and so we have, like, Miss Lumpy, um, Junior Miss Lumpy, Teen Miss. I think it's actually Teen Miss, then Junior Miss, and then Little Miss Lumpy. And my little cousin's actually Little Miss Lumpy this year. Oh. Yeah, and her Congrats. mom used to be Miss Lumpy a while back. But those are kind of a big deal. And Did you ever do it? I, no. I, you said, would I? No, did you? No, I'm not, like, living enough in, like, the radius of the county because it's, like, a oh, responsibility. Oh, that's right, that's right, yeah. Like, yeah. you don't just, like, win you the pageant. Around. Like, you're a representative of our tribe. So, like, a lot of times they'll travel, go to powwows, and, um, you know, part of the pageant is, like, your talent, and for a lot of people it's singing. Wow. <laughs> so, like, you know, they might travel and go to powwows and, like, sing or perform, but, like, they represent us, and... I'm forgetting we also have a senior Miss Lumbee pageant. Yeah, I'm looking and at it right now. That is my favorite one to attend. My favorite one. Um, it's just always a good time. Um, wow. Yeah. Is that like grandma's? Yeah. Yeah, love yeah. It. It's just it's it's just so fun <laughs> and like there was and I do not remember her name, we were like literally looking at the pictures. This was not this year, but the year before. Oh my gosh. Uh, there was one lady that like, oh I loved her talent so much. It was essentially like she had her like grandchildren come sit on the stage and she brought out like pictures and a book and like just kind of had them get comfortable and then she just told them stories about like their wow. ancestors and their family members and that was like so sweet to watch Aww. and witness and like some of them their talent might be singing sometimes dancing art um i think my little cousin's talent was dance Aww. i believe um but like the pageants are kind of a big deal um, because then that's they're part of like our cultural team that like travels mm -hmm. and represents us kind of throughout the powwow circuits in the state because there are um quite a few other state recognized tribes and like there was just a powwow in guilford county so like it's very common for like lumbies and like other natives in the state to kind of travel around and go to the different powwows and different events um and then also at homecoming, there's like a parade and we have a bunch of fireworks. Um, it's kind of like a all week event, just time with family. Um, you kind of get out, get to see some people. The pageants are a big deal. Um, the tickets for like the Miss Lumbee pageant have like skyrocketed mm. recent years. And like, I say like Lumbee Met Gala cause people like dress up. That is like the event to go to. So like when those tickets drop, it's ridiculous wow. how fast they go. That's pretty cool. It wow. reminds me of the Merry Monarch Hula Festival mm. in Hilo. Like, it's similar, you mm -hmm. know? It's a showcasing of cultural practice. And yeah. Everybody gets dressed in their finery <laughs> and trying to get tickets. Pretty yeah. crazy. Yeah. That's cool. So do you have people who travel, like, from far, far away to come home every year for homecoming? Um, yeah, so I mean, like, for us, for my family, we would come home every summer, no matter if we lived in California, Texas, like, Alabama. There were some summers where we weren't able to make it, but, like, um, like so with, like, my grandparents' generation, like, my nana, um, she was one of, I believe, like, eight or nine siblings, um, and, like, so many of her siblings at one point in their life lived in either Detroit, so I have, like, cousins in Detroit, um, Baltimore, they're, like, little groups of like Lumbee community still there and like so for a lot of people they'll come home mm -hmm. during the summertime um and it's also like during that week the tribal office is open for people to go in and get like their tribal cards and kind of get like registered if they hadn't been before so sometimes people will use that time to also just like come home very cool 
one. That must be such registered. an important, like, traditional practice, like, just to reconnect mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. your community, with your with your, your family. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, very special. And um, I, like, in the past few summers have not been able to, like, always go because, like, the summer camp I work at, normally the week of the 4th of July, like, is when kids move in to our camp. Um, but I didn't work there this year, so I was able to, like, go home for the first time in a long time, and it was very nice. I'm usually, like, the Senior Miss Home Be or Senior Miss Lumbee pageants are usually, like, before homecoming starts, um, and then the rest of the pageants and everything are, like, in the middle of the week. So, yes, that is, like, kind of, like, a huge, huge, huge deal during the summertime, and then there are pageants and other things, um, throughout the year. Um, and like culture classes that are hosted for families to go to like during the week mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah so that's such an important part even with Noah as we work with indigenous communities and with tribes you know there's treaties and those treaties supersede everything mm -hmm. you know so I'm curious do you folks have a treaty with the US government or is there yeah so we um, not to my knowledge. Something that kind of confuses a lot of people is like we are not on a reservation of any mm -hmm. kind. Um, Lumbees and like kind of natives in that area have just kind of like been there existing. Um, and it's a very complicated process to like get that federal oh, recognition. Yeah. Um, so that's something that's kind of in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like when I was in high school, um, I think I've shared with some of you before, like I did that IB program that like mm -hmm. me and Daniel have been talking about. And one of the things that you do for that program is write this like extended essay. You choose like any topic, write up to 4,000 words, it's research. And I use that time to kind of like spend my time kind of researching and learning more about my people because, you know, I was living everywhere. I never was in school learning about Lumbees before. Um, and so, like, my research question was looking at how agriculture impacted just Lumbee culture as a whole, because, like, you know, for a long time, Lumbees were allowed to pretty much just be, like, sharecroppers. Um, and so, like, that kind of shaped a lot of Lumbee culture and community. Um, so land ownership kind of took a long time for, like, Lumbees to have in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but... No treaties, to my knowledge. Mm. And then were you folks originally from those areas, or were you moved like many of the, the so Native American tribes? The kind of prevailing like idea, and I think the thing that kind of makes the most sense to me, is that we're almost like an amalgamation, or just kind of like a mix of a lot of Native people mm -hmm. from like the general area. So like, uh, we'll find Lumbee surnames or last names in like Virginia other parts of North Carolina and like other tribes too and even in parts of South Carolina because we're like right there at the border of South Carolina so this Which the borders are kind of contemporary kind yeah. of boundaries that yeah. weren't there before and it's something too where like you know I'll meet someone else who's native in the state and they might not even be Lumbee but we start talking and then it's like who's your mom and then like 10 minutes later they'll text their family and it's like oh are you such and such as niece or you know like we the connections are there. Right. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. I'm looking, I've been looking at this website. Do you have earrings that are lumpy? Yeah. I think I was wearing them yesterday. The yeah. Pinecone Patrick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I saw the colors and I saw yeah. it and I was like, I think I complimented you on those earrings yeah. yesterday. And you're looking um, at Senior Miss Lumbee 2023. Yes. That's our Senior Miss Lumbee and our tribal chairman. Um, yeah, I was looking at, like, these are so cute. Like, they're <laughs> so cute. Yeah, so in our regalia, um, kind of like our traditional wear, um, you'll see a lot of that pinecone patchwork design. Mm. And I tried, like, when I was in high school to learn how to kind of, like, sew it. Mm -hmm. And, oh, it's so difficult. Um, but, yes, you'll see that pattern a lot in our regalia or just, like, kind of any symbols um so i think some of those pictures you're looking at right now are some of our like cultural team members that mm -hmm. travel and kind of represent us at different places um and i'm seeing some pictures of like houses pop up um there are yeah. some projects that the tribe 
like our tribal government is funding for like elders to like get housing um, and then also like veterans there's kind of like a veterans community